Thank you very much, Claire. And hello, everyone. I hope everyone is good this evening. It's a pleasure to be here. And as Claire said in the intro there, this is definitely a collaboration, which has been certainly a number of years in the making. So I'm really, really pleased uh, to have the opportunity to welcome you to this session on UAM or unmanned traffic management, unmanned aerial uh, migration, whatever you want to call it. It's all about the future here. Now, we are on the cusp of the, uh, the most significant development in aviation since the advent of the airplane. And as we move towards a future where drones are increasingly sharing the skies with manned aircraft, many questions and challenges arise. But as all of that drone use continues to increase, what actually needs to change to truly unlock their potential? And we'll be focusing on that question tonight. Now, in this presentation, we're certainly going to be discussing something that's very close to my heart called unified traffic management. And the idea behind unified traffic management is the bringing together of all different types of aerial craft into a single unified system that enables very succinct, very safe, very efficient navigation. And we're going to talk about the crucial supporting and enabling role that it's going to be playing in helping to unlock the potential of drones to deliver a wide variety of new services, everything from transportation and delivery to industrial infrastructure, maintenance, you name it. It's effectively the future of urban aerial mobility. So as Claire said, you know, my, my name is Richard Parker and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Outer Angel. I founded the company about five and a half years ago. Now, firstly, before we begin, I want to say certainly thank you very much for registering for this webinar hosted by the Royal Institute of Navigation. I'm very much delighted to be here presenting to you and explaining how Altitude Angel is laying the foundations for the future of not only air travel, but a wide variety of services delivered through unmanned aerial vehicles. Now, over the next few slides, I'll be outlining the services that we provide as a UTM company and then also defining what that means. But first, just a, a little bit about our company. So firstly, let's, let's talk about our mission. Now, our mission is absolutely to unlock and unify the airspace. And the reason we want to do that is we want to enable more people and more organizations to access the potential of, of, of drones or unmanned aerial systems. We're committed to unlocking that airspace to enable those beneficial impacts to be felt by pretty much any industry, whether it's commercial or it's societal, industrial. We can all use the sky in creative ways. We just need the tools to be able to manage that. Now, certainly many drone operators today will have used or, or touched Altitude Angels products and services directly and potentially even indirectly. So whether you're using our world leading service, dronesafetymap.com, which is a free resource providing important local safety maps um, in over 40 countries or, or indirectly, for example, um, in Norway, the UK or in India or North America, many European member states where we have deployed or we're talking um, about deploying our, and operating our systems nationally to help deliver on that mission to actually unify the airspace and unlock those fantastic use cases for drones we're all thinking about. Now, of course, a core focus for us, like any aviation company, is safety. And we use technology to ensure that drone pilots, aircraft pilots, airspace managers, regulators, and even software developers and drone manufacturers can all innovate safely together and crucially can connect to each other so that our societies and our economies can actually benefit from this drone technology. So, of course, when we think about drones for surveys, we have different safety concerns and different challenges associated with thinking about transporting human cargo going from A to B, as in um, this is the common use case for urban aerial mobility. Now, the sky above our heads is certainly a, a, an amazing resource, and we just have to figure out collectively how we can truly utilize that to its, to its maximum benefit, to unlock its potential. And, and that is what we do at Altitude Angel. So before we go on and before we take a look into the future, let's just outline where we are currently, because I'm aware in the audience we'll have people that 
are very well versed with drone technology. You may have people who are not yet um, uh, proficient or familiar with it. So let's just take a few moments to, to level the playing field a little bit. Now I'd wager that as a member or follower of the Royal Institute of Navigation, you're fairly interested in some way, clearly about the art of navigation, but certainly about the use or advancement of navigation technologies and how they may be applicable in this new and emerging field of transport. Now, maybe you fly drones or you're in the business of aviation, manned or unmanned. Perhaps you're more interested in what's going to be happening on the ground. And now you're just kind of curious, what is all this fuss about? Now, however you're involved, we can probably arrive, however, at some very common observations about the airspace above our heads today. Now. The sky is a largely quiet place. Now, let's just take a moment to think about that. And certainly in the pre-pandemic world, um, you know, globally, the sum total of all commercial airline flights that took place every year was only about 40 million, four zero million. So that, that gives you an idea when you look up in the sky, even if you live in and around a busy airport, the sky is, is, is reasonably empty, taken by volume. And to give you an idea, if, if each flight, uh, each one of those 40 million flights was undertaken by, by, by one plane, so in other words, there were 40 million planes, we could park two planes in every square mile on the planet and still have a lot more room. So, you know, there, there is definitely a lot of resource that we're not, uh, we're not tapping into today. There's another key point that's a challenge and a blocker, really, for thinking about why drones aren't all around the place today. The first is that aerial restrictions aren't standardized around the world or sometimes even inside the country to which they relate to. And this is very, very um, common, particularly as they relate specifically to drone operations. And one of the biggest challenges is as we become more familiar as societies about how we want to roll this technology out, those regulations are in a state of flux. And sometimes, you know, from year to year, they're changing quite rapidly. So. That might be fine if we're talking about humans making all of the decisions. But as we move forwards in time, we're talking about less human interaction from a piloting perspective and more automated navigation. So not having um, a standardized view that could be digitized is a, is a slight problem. And because of that, it's not always clear where operators of drones can or cannot legally fly. And, you know, add to that, you have this kind of non-unified mosaic of drone zones that are sort of pro-drone zones and then zones that don't apply for, for drones, don't welcome drones. So that's very, very challenging. And then, of course, next up is perhaps the holy grail in the drone industry is the fact that aerial flights that you conduct with your drone are limited to one pilot's visual line of sight. And I think the regulations in many countries sort of standardize around it has to be unaided line of sight. So you can't use a 200 times telescope to, to boost your flight range. And if you think about that in the context of an industrial drone that needs to survey, for example, a thousand miles of pipeline or railway infrastructure, then that would mean putting the drone in your Land Rover, you know, driving out to your, it's not as beneficial and as low cost as it could be if we could truly go beyond line of sight. And then getting access to fly drones commercially or in sub drones is absolutely growing exponentially. And new use cases are being discovered and trialed on a daily basis in almost every single environment, whether it's rural, urban, remote, or a mixture where you can improve the speed or the resolution of data and the quality of data that you can collect and at the same time reduce cost. And that's particularly interesting in this field of drones because typically the only other way to get information from the sky is to put a plane or a helicopter in it. And that means crews, that means ground maintenance, that means fuels, very, very, very costly. So follow me on a journey as we go and have a quick tour at tomorrow's skies and have a look around there. Now, where we're coming from and where we need to get to is effectively best summarized by a single phrase. We need to imagine new ways to approach the management of all of that air traffic. And we can certainly say in tomorrow's skies, there is going to be a busier sky. 
And it's going to consist of a mixture of both manned and unmanned aircraft, as well as aircraft that are both piloted remotely and aircraft that have no human pilot at all. So that's going to require then new policies and procedures and definitely new technical systems. And, and all of this traffic is going to need coordination, just as manned aircraft are coordinated today. Effectively, all aircraft, before they take off, they plan to avoid each other by announcing their routes and, and, and following traditional patterns, etc. But there are always unforeseen circumstances. So we need clever ways to be able to react to those in a safe and predictable manner. And then we're going to have to contend with new classifications of airspace, including those that have a much more granular activation schedule and transit requirements associated with them. So if you're not familiar with those terms, then just briefly imagine in your mind's eye, if you will, a three dimensional volume of the airspace above your house where you're sat right now. And that might start, let's say, 200 feet above the ground and extend up a thousand feet. And it might be a you know, a circle uh, a, a, or cylinder, rather, a mile in radius. That volume is not necessarily a static volume. That volume might be permeable to you if you have a certain um, type of aircraft or you have a, a particular type of mission. Or in some instances, it might simply not be relevant. It might be switched off, if you like, depending on the time of the day. And we see this today in traditional aviation. You have things like glider sites that might only be active on the weekend. So during the weekend, um, most need to be extra careful when they fly there or even maybe not fly there at all. And then during the week when the, the, the gliding school is not active, that section of airspace is, is free and open to everyone to travel through. Now, that problem, when we think about drones and in the future and drones that need to come in and land on the top of railway stations and whisk people around in aerial taxis, we need much richer and denser maps that can cope with all of that information. And then the last thing, and this is the one that usually gets most people um, thinking about the future, is all of these use cases for drones. And, you know, five, six years ago when we started the company, people were much more wary of drones because typically drones were associated with particularly bad operations in the sky. You can imagine what they're all about. But fast forward to today. And almost every industry has figured out how it could benefit from drones. And even in the UK, we're, we're using drones now to test the delivery of COVID-19 vaccines. And it's, it's not all, uh, if you excuse the pun, pie in the sky. These things can cut down transit times. They can cut down distribution costs and they can increase the fidelity and the speed with which we can get, for example, life-saving medications out to people. But before we go too much further, I want to pour a little bit of cold water on the idea that Certainly anyone at Altitude Angel believes that, you know, for example, your favorite online retailer will be delivering DVDs to your house, um, you know, anytime soon. That's certainly not the most prominent use case in the shortest time frames. And actually what we're looking at here is big logistics companies, your FedExes, your UPSs and DHLs who predominantly move cargo via the air anyway today, moving more of that cargo between airports on smaller aircraft that become more automated. And that enables them to fly more frequently, um, to fly more efficiently and to fly for longer in, in many instances. So it's very, very interesting scenarios that get unlocked. And there's just a few on the screen there for you to consider, but pretty much all walks of life can be touched by the um, having ubiquitous and equitable access to the airspace. Now, ultimately, all of the aforementioned <laughs> is the goal of UTM. It is the goal of enabling greater, more efficient use of those shared and of that shared and wondrous resource rather that we have above our heads and to democratize access to it and make it available on fair and equitable terms. Now, most people in the drone ecosystem may have heard about those three little letters before, U, T and M, and, and very often, it is used to refer to unmanned traffic management. In other words, traffic management that only has to do with aircraft that don't have pilots on board. And that's the definition that we don't like. It's actually, as we said right at the start, it's about unification. So the U there is about bringing together all of the traffic in the airspace. And it's broadly speaking, it's the ability to locate and assist with the navigation of all aerial craft. 
And note that it's not a product and it's not a service and it's not about one company. It is firstly about the gradual introduction of more automation into the management of the airspace and into the communication between all of the stakeholders. And automation requires organization and connectivity. And all of those things are key tenets of unified traffic management. And to do all of this effectively, the UTM systems need to provide augmented capabilities to our existing air traffic management networks and processes. Now, they're just not built for the kind of scow and technologies and advancements that we're thinking of here. So we need to figure out how to include those and, and integrate with them. And these are the types of systems that typically look after airspace around airports and aerodromes and above most major cities in the world. So if we don't integrate with these, then drones can't fly in these locations. And that's not going to, well, fly for anyone. Now, we also need new mechanisms, as we said at, at the top there, to facilitate the communication between those stakeholders, but more to do with just getting airborne in the first place. So from the pilots through to the regulators, the folks who have to enforce the rules and the managers of the airspace and all of the other interested parties in between. And as we move forwards in time, it's sensible to assume that much of those interactions will be very repetitive. For example, like getting a request uh, into an air traffic control system so that uh, you can get an automated permission to take off if you meet certain criteria. But a key factor to remember is that UTM technology properly designed and deployed just opens up regions of the sky which are off limits today. And UTM, therefore, is the digital infrastructure for the future of our skies. And that infrastructure is being laid now. So let's put UTM in some context. Most services offered by UTMs today orient towards the drone pilot and is the person in charge of the drone. And ensuring that those people have access to the right data, such as accurate aeronautical maps to help them fly safely and legally, to help them avoid each other in the airspace, or to give them awareness of nearby air traffic, for instance. And that is to say, UTM is already ingesting, organizing, and providing consistent information across the entire domain and adapting its output so that both humans and machines can utilize it. And although we, we haven't got a lot of content on this in today's talk, those in the audience that are familiar with traditional aeronautical maps can't simply rely on those when thinking about piloting a drone instead. You know, aeronautical maps are absolutely a part of that equation, but they're only a small part of it. There are many other things that affect drone operators as well. And being able to interpret the sheer volume of data and to have it personalized to you, remembering, as I said, that one version of the map is no longer static. For me, it may look different to your map in the same location because I may have a specific permission or exemption and all of our digital systems need to be aware of that. Now UTMs therefore bring very rich, accurate and relevant safety data from multiple different sources, direct to drone pilots via apps and what we call ground stations. So those are effectively the remote piloting computers that a pilot stands in front of or sits down in front of and looks at a screen and kind of has the cockpit transported directly to them. We need to integrate with all of these systems. And then of course, UTM is also uh, helping the airspace managers like the air traffic controllers um, uh, to have better communication with drone pilots and then also to deliver services which in some countries are already automated, all with a view to making it much easier for drone pilots to get airborne. Now, UTM systems are already helping to standardize the world's aeronautical information and to establish many more new digital services that are analogous, broadly speaking, to the way air traffic control works today. And in some countries, such as the ones that use our technologies, knowledge of those drone operations can actually also be shared with other airspace users. So GA pilots, commercial aircraft, etc. Um, and, and that helps with safety and conflict management. It's part of that integration. Now, the more advanced 
still then go on to rely on our technologies to provide automated management of transit and access requests, not just to the drone pilots via trendy web apps and interfaces, but directly to the ground control systems or even on board systems directly on, on the drones so that the most complex and the risky drone operations can be carried out using real-time tracking, just like large commercial aircraft. But even these can only really be considered the basics. For UAM scenarios and advanced automated piloting scenarios, we certainly need a lot more. Now, as we look to tomorrow then, or really as we call it, the transition period, and for those watching in November, I'm not talking about the Brexit transition period, um, UTM or unifying the airspace is much more about integration and connecting drone pilots, urban aerial mobility aircraft, the stakeholders that manage the airspace and other users together on a common yet open platform, a digital operating system for our skies, if you will. Now, the job of organizing our skies then and being that operating system and managing that information flow and describing it and securing it is a very tough job, but it is a very, very, very critical job. And UTMs will not only disseminate information, but they'll collate it and they'll generate new information and offer digital services to help travel in the modern airspace take place safely and effectively and efficiently at scale. And then lastly, UTMs will also help with interesting services like capacity management, the concepts that in um, in some of the most advanced air traffic management scenarios today, we're really only still starting to, quote unquote, push the boat out in terms of how closely we can put aircraft together so we can maximize the landing capabilities and the takeoff slots available at airports. But UTMs have a bigger job than even that, because we're not talking about 40 million flights per year. We're potentially talking about 40 million a month, even more than that as time goes forwards. So the job of managing all that capacity routes through that uh, through those regions of airspace, as well as airspace protection and conflict resolution and the ability effectively to help drones being piloted by different service providers to avoid each other, as well as other, other airspace users safely and securely, securely. That is the role of UTM. So hopefully by now you'll agree that Without UTM, it's very difficult to imagine how our skies could possibly manage the future we're all thinking about. Now, I'd like to use this slide just to dispel a few misconceptions, because it's um, anyone that's spent any time kind of looking into this field or even people who are scratching their heads, wondering and, and thinking intellectually about the problem, more often than not, come up with, you know, a cluster around a series of common questions, frequently asked questions, and those are often presented as reasons why UTM can't happen. And I want to try and dispel some of those myths for you here today. Quite often, folks assume that UTM is all about tracking. And certainly, whilst it's important that in more complex scenarios in high risk areas, so for example, imagine a 40 kilo or a 50 kilo unmanned survey aircraft flying over the busy populated area of London, we would say that that is a more complex and more risky scenario than a farmer flying a drone over a very large empty field. Certainly, risk and complexity, therefore, necessitates different levels of what in our trade we call conspicuity, the ability to see and track things. But it's definitely not always necessary to consider that every drone should be trackable or even visible to a centralized system in much the same way that cars and other automobiles aren't trackable everywhere all the time. But consider what happens if you enter a high security area, like in the vicinity of an airport or a government building. Then, of course, your vehicle is tracked. You have ANPR cameras that are tracking your every movement as you move around the city of London, etc. So again, we're very good as a society at putting controls where we need them. But sometimes we're also good at throwing up barriers where we don't need them. And we certainly don't need to consider that we must have systems that are capable of sensing everything everywhere all of the time before we can start to get these amazing use cases of drones up in the air today. 
And certainly some of the more reputable UTM companies in the world will assist with what we call the concept of operations. In other words, that's the policies and the procedures that are set at a national level that effectively set the right parameters for what types of drones need to be tracked and where, according to the type of work they're conducting, the location and everything that is associated with that. So, and this is very, very similar to the way that air traffic is managed today. And while it's true that certainly many aviation authorities are investigating a future where flying vehicles are equipped with transponding equipment, not everything needs to be visible at all times. And even in that future, there are scenarios where those flying things still won't be visible, even if they have all the necessary equipment. So designing any UTM system without factoring in what we call non-cooperative air traffic is another aspect that we have to think about. That's traffic that perhaps is not transponding by accident or not transponding by, by design. It's intending to, to be incognito. So we have to think about that. So if we add that summation up there, what I'm really saying is, you know, this ultimately, if we treat this as a misconception, then it also has the added advantage that it's not necessary to wait until every single vehicle is connected into a UTM or has a tracker device before allowing these drone operations to flourish, even the more complex ones. Now, second thing is we hear this a lot. It's only for commercial or automated flights. And, and unfortunately, that's just that's not true either. As we spoke about a little bit earlier, UTM technologies are actually already helping millions of drone flights take place successfully every year, even under line of sight rules. And the majority of these are piloted by humans, not machines, for a variety of purposes, including fun and business. So it's just simply not true that this is the preserve of the wealthy, uh, the wealthiest companies or the most well-paid drone operators. Um, the UTMs today play a critical role in de-risking airspace operations for absolutely everybody. The other one we hear as well is, you know, UTMs can't help me if I'm flying in a remote, uh, remote location and there's just no cellular coverage. And that unfortunately is also a misconception because UTMs also help people plan flights and download relevant maps and information about their remote operations long before they get to the field or their flying location so that they can take those with them offline. Systems like ours, for instance, even work with satellite connectivity, which is absolutely essential when considering the humanitarian and, and disaster relief efforts that happen around the world, when ground connectivity is just no longer available, but careful coordination and planning of um, aircraft, both manned and unmanned, is a necessity. And we see this increasingly during disaster scenarios, both manned and unmanned aircraft are working in tandem. And it's a real magical blend of technology coming together in many instances to deliver life-saving aid much more quickly and much more efficiently. So just as we begin to wrap up, I'd like to leave you with a few key messages. And the first is that UTM is absolutely an enabler for a variety of aerial operations. And it's not any one app or any one company. It calls for gradual improvements and more automation being available within our existing airspace systems and networks to help them cope with the increases in traffic volume um, uh, from all of these new and all of these innovative classes of air traffic. And it provides for a common platform to assist with things like compliance and safety planning and communications, to name just a few. And of course, to be able to deliver these capabilities directly to those human pilots as well as automated systems. And in order to realize the future that we all hope for, one where certainly drone technology is able to, to actually transform lives and to revolutionize businesses, we have to do that safely. And the only real way we can do that is by unifying and uniting all airspace users onto a single common platform. It doesn't mean they have to use a single common app but there needs to be a backbone which is shared and accessible to all. And it certainly doesn't mean that all aircraft need to be upgraded or to buy new hardware. But it does mean that we have to, on a country by country basis, start tackling what happens when we have aircraft that we cannot sort of quote unquote see 
or operating in areas where drones also want to operate. And then finally, at Altitude Angel, we're busy building these systems and deploying them. And in fact, many countries around the world today have already deployed these, these operating system components that enable them to bring this innovation to their airspace for the benefit of the drone ecosystem. And we're absolutely an advocate of unmanned aircraft, of urban aerial mobility, and of that unified and integrated flying experience. And perhaps most importantly, of letting innovation take flight. So ladies and gentlemen, I wanna say thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. And I think I'm gonna hand you back now to Claire. But just before I do, again, I wanna say thank you very much to the Royal Institute of Navigation for hosting me tonight.